Hello, wherever you are in the world today, welcome to Beyond the Art in our series, The Stories That Carry Us. I'm your host, Craig Beaumont Flynn, a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and the Delaware Tribe of Indians. In each episode, we will discuss with various Native American artists, influencers, art leaders, and everyone in between their experiences, the communities they serve, and the translation and interpretation of the Native American art world today. Okay. Well, welcome to Beyond the Art. Today we have Liana Shui, a Muscogee Nation citizen, and Karina Emmerich, a Pelup. Pelup, is that correct? You all up. Pelup, uh, citizen. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much for having us, Mado. Well, tell us a little bit about relative arts and a little bit about your background and your stories of how you came together and uh, relative arts uh, launching off. Uh, yeah, so take it away, Karina. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been working as a clothing designer for uh, since about 2015, um, when I launched my brand Emmy Studio. And um, the more that I worked in that um, field, the more I really wanted to focus more on upcycling and doing um, a greater, broader work. So we had an opportunity in November to open up a shop and Leanna and I decided to team up to create a new endeavor called Relative Arts, where we could really focus on channeling a bunch of different indigenous artists rather than just focusing on a few. Mm -hmm. So we have now over 20 indigenous artists in store from all over the States, Canada and Mexico. Um, and it's just been a hit since we opened on April 1st. So, yeah, Leanna, anything else you want to add? Um, yeah, I guess that's the, the, <laughs> the short of it. And um, Karina and I had been organizing together in New York for a few years before we started to kind of conceive this idea of what it would look like to have a physical location where we could not only celebrate and foster the art and the work of our indigenous relatives and kin from across Turtle Island. Um, but in our community organizing that we were doing, one of the things that I really, uh, you know, we, we discovered as a collective and as people uh, working in like social justice and advocacy movements was that having actual space and actual physical location mm -hmm. to be able to come together is obviously um, very hard to find and right. kind of a miracle for us here in New York City and Lenape Hoking. Um, but in general, it's just so important that we have this space to be able to like come together, to gather together. And then especially with New York City being such a uh, historical meeting place and like kind of crossroads and trading grounds uh, for indigenous people um, since forever, it made a lot of sense for us knowing that our uh, community was often like coming through here, whether it's right. for the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues or if it's for, you know, being represented at the Whitney or, you know, whatever, whatever brings indigenous people here still today. Mm -hmm. We didn't have necessarily the kind of like landing pad that we had wished for when when we were starting off here and Karina has been in New York for a lot longer than I have so um, it's in that forming of the community it became so important for us to have that space as well to be able to continue to grow our community and, and nurture that um, that space. So tell me a little bit about the collective uh, artists that you bring into the relative art space and some of the products that they design and create and that you have display within the facility. Yeah, we really wanted to focus the shop on contemporary work um, from some of, I mean, we have all ages of artists in shop right now, but we have some as, as young as, you know, 16 to in their 50s. And we really wanted to focus on uh, contemporary Indigenous work and bringing voice to uh, our contemporary uh, work now today rather than being pegged often into this um, historical concept that we're generally 
put in. Mm -hmm. Um, So we really wanted to bring up a store, not only to represent people who are working today, but the work that's being done today and, and how innovative it can be. And we also saw a need for representation in indigenous fashion in New York City as a one of the largest fashion hubs in the world. Actually, yeah. There's no other store like ours. And it just felt like the only places you could go see some contemporary work would be at a museum. And it's still putting us in this historical context. Correct. So we really wanted to do something that was for a younger crowd, that was for everybody, but that really represented uh, work that's being done today. So we have fashion designers, printmakers, jewelry designers. Um, we have pieces from $5 to $2,000. We have a wide range of work from all over. Poets, um, we currently musicians. carry people like, mm-hmm, yeah, writers. We carry some books. Um, we currently carry uh, artists like Jennifer Younger, who's an incredible Tlingit artist. Um, jewelry maker. We also carry uh, El Tuchichi, who's originally from Oaxaca, who lives locally in the Lower East Side. Um, we carry Section 35 from up north. Um, we carry Mobilize from up north, um, an upcycle brand by Dusty Legrand. Um, we have so many different artists in a wide variety, and we're hoping to continue to grow those artists the longer that we're around and can create trust in our community and in what we're doing. Absolutely. I mean, create the evolution continues to grow as a culture and a people and our, our uh, arts. So it's good that there's such a, such an amazing thing that you're doing this. What has been the response from the native American community and the non-native community in seeing this? Do they think it's um, non-natives, you know, it's more of a, uh, a uh, novelty item or are they actually understanding what you're trying to achieve? We've had both, I think, depending what our, our, we are a hundred percent a destination spot. So almost every day that we're open, we have people who came there specifically to come there that day. And it's usually our indigenous relatives right. <laughs> um, who are really, really excited to come by the shop and see what we're carrying because it's their friends and it's their family. And, we also have a lot of non-native artists coming to check out what the scene is because mm-hmm. it's not really something that people are super familiar with when they think they want to go by indigenous art. They don't necessarily expect to see a birded, uh, excuse me, a beaded Kirby holding a knife, right? Like right, some, right. some of our more humorous pieces in store. Um, but, but it's been a, such a positive response. I can't, uh, I can't explain how overwhelmingly positive it's been so far. That's fantastic. Yeah. And I think that it's, it's like so awesome to be able to provide that space and for people to come and be so excited when they enter into the space and to feel so, so like welcome. And they, I would say like the average shopper who comes in, like our typical shopper clientele or whatever is, um, our typical customer is indigenous and probably like on their way to the airport, but they like come and they stay a while. Usually they're there for like an hour. Right. Um, just like we have a couch. We're pretty hospitable. We'll offer up a LaCroix <laughs> and we will just like sit Not and like, share stories and talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Just kidding. laughs> I know. If you want to sponsor hey. us. <laughs> uh, I'll take some LaCroix lifetime of LaCroix. Um, but yeah, so it's it's just like really has become a a space that is a destination and it's not even necessarily for like the retail aspect of it. We are a community space that just so happens mm-hmm. to also sell clothes kind of like to keep right. the lights on, you know, um, but more importantly for us to just like be able to create this space. And then those who don't come as a destination, those who wander in. We have been so held by the local community. The um, We're in the East Village. I guess you might call it like Alphabet City, but it is um, sure. known as Loisida. Um, it is a big like Taino, New Yorkian community that uh, has been there for so long. And uh, we, even the people who walk by who have like just lived in the neighborhood for so long, like they kind of come in and like a little bit are like vetting us, <laughs> checking us out, making making sure and like all respect to that and um they really welcome us in like actually one of the like uh neighborhood guys who we see on the street every day and always say hey what's up 
uh, he came in the other day and was just like, I'm rooting for you all. This is awesome. Like, and, and receiving that is, is so cool for just to know that like, we are um, making our, our impact and our part of, of continuing the legacy of the work that, um, the Loisaida community has has been doing for, right. Right. Ever. I mean, you've become such a focal point, and part of it, I think, is right now we're on the ebb and flow portion of excitement about Native American art and culture, and hopefully, it continues to grow and grow and go upwards. So, having a space like this where you have a collective, I think, is an amazing um, show of not just one tribe but multiple tribes. You know, being five hundred ninety, five hundred plus. Uh, indigenous tribes in the country, I think non-natives think it's just one tribe. It's like, no, we're, we're multiple people with multiple cultures and multiple heritage. Some of it is interconnected and some of it is just very identifiable to one nation. Have you seen um, the response and the excitement from other tribal members from tribes and nations themselves, besides the actual artists from those tribes? We, Because we have so many visitors on a regular basis. We work with so many different people from all different tribes. Mm-hmm. I think that a lot of our artists are, um, you know, it's not just about them as an individual. It's about them being able to represent their own families, their own legacies and things like that and how they're choosing to put it into a contemporary context. Mm-hmm. And um, we see, I mean like you said, you know, we're not a monolith and, and like to say what Leanna said, we're still a big trading ground. So we have people from all over who are just so excited to see, you know, whether it be somebody from their tribe represented in the store, which is so exciting. You know, I have people coming in asking me what Salish sea means. And it's not a question I get often in New York city. (laughs) Um, So it's been, it's really exciting to be like, okay, we're creating visibility and representation. um, And it's for so many people. And we continue to grow that the more that we reach out to different artists and different tribal nations all over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's just, the way that we, um, I don't know, I, I hate to say like define indigeneity, but like indigeneity to me is is um, open to mm-hmm. the diaspora. And I really love that we have representation from north of the so-called colonial border of Canada um, and down south and in Central America as well. And um, people from the Caribbean, you know, like all uh, represented in our shop and like being able to kind of find a piece of themselves there. Mm -hmm. Um, We were also uh, shortly after our opening, we were interviewed by the Navajo times, which was like really exciting because we carry, we like Dene people are, are our relatives. We have a lot of Navajo friends and uh, carry their art in, in the shop. And I think that that's like one of the quotes that they used is I was just like, Dene are our relatives. They are our kin, you know? Yep. Um, and so, uh, and even just, uh, I've been doing my due diligence, reaching out, trying to find that funding. <laughs> and I was, uh, I was calling up the Muskogee fund the other day. Um, and, um, the, the guy I was talking to at the Muskogee fund, like he was just like, so amped about like what we were doing. And like, so like, it was really cool to like hear someone from, from my tribe to be like, Oh, what? I've heard of you. Like, that's awesome. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, like the, the words getting out there. And I think just the fact that, that we are kind of this destination spot and that people come in and they're like, Oh, I, I saw you on Instagram or like, uh, Indian country today. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the uh, guardian, the guardian. So like people, the words getting out and, and people are, are, um, are into it and and talking about it and just like there's there's buzz and excitement because there hasn't really been anything much like this before. No, never. Um, what? How did you come up with the name Relative Arts and how did you both decide that this is what it's going to be and kind of program it out? Yeah, yeah we really wanted to. We keep doing that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> we we really wanted to find a term that was a connecting term. Um, We had originally come from a group, a direct action and mutual aid group called the Indigenous Kinship Collective. And we really wanted to kind of bring that more into an artist's 
perspective. Mm -hmm. So we had toyed around with the idea of calling it the Relative Creative Collective. But we wanted it to have something that just was a little bit shorter, a little bit right. more, you know, uh, ungeneralized so that we could grow because we are a community space in addition to being an art collective. Um, so relative arts just seemed like the perfect term. And, and it's a great term to invite in all of our relatives. Um, you know, we're all related and and that way we can just really be all encompassing of whoever we want. So we're not putting any parameters around us necessarily, besides just supporting artists mm -hmm. and cre creatives and designers and writers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel like I don't know. I just I love how relative kind of really like is vague. <laughs> it's just the relative <laughs> arts, you know, it, whatever whatever art you're into. It rolls Any off of the that. tongue really easy. Yeah, <laughs> it, it rolls nicely. And I think that also in this creation of the space and coming from like a direct action community organizing um, collective, we wanted to make sure that in the naming of it and in the way the space is held, that it was known that it was like, open to all and that this right. is like not it's not our store it's like it's everybody's space right it's like you know i just happen to be the one on the lease but like this <laughs> space is for community um and so we wanted to um make it sound like more of like an open door than like a members only club correct correct or like a gallery space i guess is yeah. there is there a right. certain process or onboarding for indigenous participants to be in the relative arts space? Yeah, that's something that we're developing as we are learning. Um, we're learning every step of the way. So this collection that we started in April um, was our first collection. And the 20 indigenous artists were people who are just already in our community of artists. So I often equate it to like, when you're sharing people's work on Instagram, mm -hmm. we just get to do that in real life now. So luckily through my work doing fashion shows at Santa Fe Indian Market and at Vancouver Indigenous Fashion Week, as well as the Indigenous Fashion and Arts Festival in Toronto, I was able to meet and connect with so many incredible artists and fashion designers. And Leanna's got a great ear for poetry sound music and so she's been really pivotal in taking care of on that role um and then we can bring that together and as we have started people are now reaching out to us asking how do they become a part of of the collection um we we don't want to overwhelm ourselves too much right. i think we we're going to try and keep it at about 20 artists a season our seasons will run from, uh, you know, February to September, September to February. So uh, spring, summer and a fall, winter season. So you do um, a rotation. what we're starting out with. Yeah. So we can continue to have new artists in That's store and give more opportunities for people each season. Mm -hmm. And being a fashion designer, it, I would assume part of your fashion designs are within the space as well. Yeah, I have I have some pieces there. L luckily, things went fast. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, you know, trying to keep up while balancing running the business. But um, I have exciting plans to continue to use and utilize this space for my own fashion as well. And in addition to it being a store, it's also an open studio mm -hmm. so I can work from there when people come visit and they can see the work that we're putting in the shop actually being done. And right now we're working on cutting our first relative arts um, upcycled collection. So we'll have an in-house collection as well. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. So how do you both play a part into relative arts? Who does what being a collective of, of two individuals that are very creative, how do you balance that of who does what and responsible for the business for funding for <laughs> paying the bills and such well we have a funny uh our like house dynamic in the shop is we uh 
we were really lucky to uh, get an early on like adopter intern uh, that uh, supports us. Shout out to Nishina. We love you. We miss you. She went out of town, had to go back to her. Also to one of the stuff. artists. And is also one of the artists. So she started out interning for us um, and we brought her on as our artist in residence. Don't ask us how that process works. <laughs> 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 that, that's what we're calling her. Um, but uh and in the shop, I, I'm dad, Karina's mom, and, oh. and the shit is like our. <laughs> so I do a lot of the like. Um, whatever that means. <laughs> whatever that means. But I do, a, yeah, gender roles. Ugh. But I do like a lot of the like day to day, like, um, I would say like operational mm-hmm. things. I'm like, I just, I'm very good with a spreadsheet and like really like making sure all the like T's are crossed and I's are dotted. Um, Karina, when when we started this and we were like, what are our roles going to be? I called myself the director of programming because it was really important to me to be able to bring in um, like events and, um, you know, just and, and, and take us out for events. Um, and Karina is our, what do we call you? Creative director? Creative um, director, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm... Karina... <laughs> yeah. yeah. I get a... Um, I get to do uh, communication with all the artists and putting uh, pieces in store, helping with selections from the different artists and designers. Um, Also just kind of taking care of the vibe along with Nishina. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we're creating a really fun space that we want it to be really welcoming. Uh, We want it to be a little bit more DIY than it is a gallery. So it's always changing and something new is always going to be in the store. Something's always evolving. Um, and that's really what we've been focusing on. And then also heading up the upcycling uh, collection. So basically all the creative stuff lands in my pot. And my weaknesses are where Leanna's strengths are and vice versa. Good so balance. it's been a really good, mm-hmm. yeah, it's been a good partnership. Yeah. And I think that like also just like worth men- just mentioning because something that I'm actively like working out as I'm in deep in this endeavor is we, you know, have come from a, a background of community organizing. And um, while we recognize that our current, uh, the current way the world works and right. whatever this country live in is, is capitalism We're and we must, you know, exist in it to survive. Um, mm-hmm. we're also trying to navigate how to create a, uh, praxis of community reciprocity. So it's, um, something that I'm developing as I go, but we're like, we're not, you know, we don't have any like huge funders. We're in our, uh, looking for like working capital and stuff. We're really trying to make sure that we are um remaining like aligned with our personal ethos and like we will not be accepting any donations from big oil companies right. <laughs> or anything like that That's good. you know like um we're definitely we, grassroots we, yeah we are definitely grassroots and are um you know we we are a small but mighty team who are just trying to figure out how to kind of like navigate these spaces in a new way that can um, uplift our indigenous uh, community and artists and not be extractive. And um, maybe even, you know, with, with the greatest hope, building a, a bit of a roadmap and how we can um, engage in uplifting one another without having to um, be beholden to capitalism. Uh, well, I, well, what you're doing, I think, is phenomenal. Is there other, you think, think tanks or startups that have approached you and seen the tremendous success you've had in such a short amount of times like oh we need to do this in chicago or la or you know uh, florida or other areas where there's a large amount of uh, indigenous communities uh besides obviously uh oklahoma that has a a heart large uh set community has there been other startups or think tanks that actually approached you and said we need this in our community or are you thinking about actually opening up a a secondary, third. Oh, she just ah raised her <laughs> eyebrows. <laughs> we, you know, there's there's other um, 
I, I've we've gotten to see some other uh, more contemporary indigenous places and spaces up in the north mm -hmm. um, that are already doing some contemporary indigenous stuff that's been really exciting and it's not something that you see a lot in the states there's not um, a lot with that right now so we are always thinking about what is next um, Leanna of course is from Oklahoma I'm originally from Oregon my family's in Washington um, so we have opportunity to expand if we wanted to um, and I think that's something that would be really exciting for the future but as far as people asking our advice I think we're still <laughs> figuring it out ourselves um, but we'd be happy to give any advice we could if it was worthy <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and I think that people would like like they are excited to, to see this. I think it's really important that kind of like our flagship or whatever shop is, uh, is here in New York City because it, um, you know, not, not just that legacy of New York being a trading grounds, but um, just very much considering the fact of, you know, how we are not on our traditional homelands. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my traditional homelands would be like Georgia. So I don't right. even get to be there because <laughs> of the Trail of Tears. Um, and, um, we very much, I think, just like bring in our identities as, um, as urban indigenous people, um, living on Lenape land and what that, what that means. And, um, for us all to kind of like be convening and here at this like moment mm -hmm. in time. So, um, it would be really awesome to be able to take something like back to our homelands and like, and, and grow it there. Um, but for us in our like urban indigenous journey, this, this makes a lot of sense for us. You mentioned uh, up North Karina, do you mean Canada? Yeah, I feel like that there's so much more representation mm. up in Canada than there is in the States. And it's, it's really inspiring people like Sage Paul inspire me all the time and the work that she does um, up there and, and to promote different artists and vendors and, fashion designers and and I see just that opportunity for us to be able to do that here and again saying you know that New York is one of the largest art hubs mm -hmm. and fashion hubs that we should have that yeah. representation here yeah also my my little fun factoid in my in my day job I'm a I'm a educator at the New York Historical Society um and yeah. you know I'm the one who I, I love to find all the little factoids <laughs> and stuff to deliver. So my most recent one that I, I keep delivering is, um, did you know <laughs> that in the most recent census that I think it was 2% uh, of the population of New York City identifies as indigenous, which shakes out to about 180,000 people who identify as American Indian or Alaska Native. So that's like bigger than the yeah, city of Tulsa. Yeah. <laughs> Right, like full of indigenous people, and that doesn't even include like mm -hmm. Taino people, right? Like if they don't, you know, or, or people who ch don't Correct. check right. that yeah. box in the census. So we have a quite large community to serve here, um, and it's, you know, like we 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 get stuff too. We get <laughs> stuff too. <laughs> what is the largest um, <laughs> tribal nation that, or tribal nation artists that are actually uh, participating? with relative arts, are you getting more Uruguay or are you getting more Southwestern or Seminoles or other, any particular that is being really represented within the space? Or is it pretty much an influx of just I, a variety? We have quite a variety. Yeah. Now I'm thinking about everybody. We have people who are Salish to Cree to Ojibwe. Mohawk to Ojibwe. To Diné, we have a few Diné artists, yeah, but very different practices. One's a Kiani, but uh, you know, it's um, like apothecary, uh, well, wellness health <laughs> health oh, wow. apothecary kind of brand. And then we also have our friend who does jewelry that says like Res Kid, like yeah. you know, so like two very different Diné artists represented. <laughs> well, then it's not Demian, necessarily in a singular poetry, box, right? <laughs> yeah, Demian Diné Yazi is a uh, writer, artist, poet, yeah. yeah. So, besides of these artists and participants uh, displaying within the space, do you also create like a maker space for them to come together and work together and create their artistry? 
or is it something down the road? We do, yeah. <laughs> so our artist in residence right now, Nishina Loft, um, who is from Tyondanega, um, she is usually seen in store beading mm. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a sewing machine available. So we do have a workspace um, that I always dreamt of if people are coming in for New York Fashion Week, that they would have a space provided to do model fittings, to do last minute alterations if that's needed. Um, you know, if we have somebody coming through that is getting a car, you're more than welcome to take a meeting in the store and use it as their space as well, their workspace. And it, it's with our hours being 12 to six, it's really flexible um, for people to drop by without having to be like a nonprofit organization where you have to have an appointment or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool that we just have a kind of an open door policy right now for any artists and makers that are coming through and anybody who would want to come by to show us their work, um, that open door policy for that as well. And yeah, we're just, we're always excited to meet new people. So what's the next phase? What's next for Relative Arts? I mean, you're, you're still, well, I guess, in a uh, growing stage. <laughs> but I mean, you're doing such a phenomenal work <laughs> and such emphasis on providing a collective for Indigenous artists. I mean... I think Leanna's, I can see her head spinning. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm like, we have one, a new development that just came up on um, Saturday. Leanna, uh -huh. I don't know if, if you want to talk about that, but it's pretty exciting with Rosa. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ah, that did come up. I got the email to prove it. <laughs> well, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we are really, like, excited for Relative Arts to kind of be able to do and be and um, help hold and create, like, whatever it is that our, our community mm -hmm. wants and needs from us. One of our friends um, who we were um, organizing with, we met through organizing here, she's um, uh, Chamaro from Guam, and she is a phenomenal musician and has um, recorded a new album and has been trying to uh, get it put out by someone who is not not like a overbearing white <laughs> dude, which is so often yeah. what it is in the music industry. I worked a lot of time in the music industry um, and, uh, and so know it pretty well. And uh, we were talking the other day and she's like, I really just like need a, you know, like a label who will like write, you know, like printed right, right. by <laughs> by whoever. And um, we, I said, you know, like it's actually been my dream. Like I like went to college. I went to university in Portland, um, and I went with every intention of starting my own record label. So I was like, well, so um, hey. Relative Arts Records wow. might be a thing, <laughs> um, and that's very exciting. Um, and then we are also working towards developing New York's first Indigenous Fashion Week that we're going to uh, try to have go off uh, in February during New York Fashion Week this year um, because it's just ridiculous. Like right. we said, you know, New York is one of the biggest like fashion hubs of the world. And the fact that there's uh, you know, Indigenous Fashion mm -hmm. Week in Vancouver, there's one in Toronto, Indigenous Fashion Arts in Toronto, there's Santa Fe Indian Market. Yeah. Why? How the heck have exactly. New York City not, not started this yet? Not, you know, how, yeah. So, um, so we're also currently developing that. Um, yeah, we've got some, some pretty like big projects kind of coming down the pipeline that we're really excited to to get our get our hands into but while also nurturing <laughs> our, our tiny little space in the east village where we're all you always gotta dream big you down. always gotta dream big that that is fantastic oh my yeah gotta keep us up up to date on that so <laughs> this is kind of a silly question because i can see the response from both of you sometimes what motivates inspires both of you <laughs> <laughs> Karina, I'll let you take it away. <laughs> Caffeine. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I feel so driven by people's 
work and sense of expression. Um, there's something I've worked in retail, I think most, most of my life. And there's something that is so precious about getting to share people's work and mm -hmm. have it come from them individually, rather than thinking about like the fashion industry itself. Um, having sales directly from the artists is so inspiring and motivating to me every day to find new work and also keep up my own work. Um, and I'm just so honored to be in community with everybody that we're in community with right now. Um, and that's definitely what drives me every day is to continue to build those relationships and that trust and, and build something beautiful and amazing along the way, which is relative arts and whatever that kind of transpires into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same. I'm going to be a little cornball <laughs> for a minute and say, Karina, you inspire me. It's like, so like Aww. my, my <laughs> constant refrain in this endeavor is that I am nothing without my community. I, you know, like at the end of the day, I, I make, you know, my own art and do things for myself. But at the end of the day, like doing the like operational stuff to make relative arts be able to blossom so that I can support my amazing community who has been out here doing this, like is, is everything to me. It's like why I keep going. It's the people who come into our store and say like, I'm so grateful that you're here. And mm -hmm. like, this is the last thing I'm doing on my trip and I needed to make sure I came here. I saved all my like pennies to like come here and be able to do whatever. Yeah. Like, that's that's really what does it for me and i um yeah and I, I think that there's just like i uh, there's i'm trying to find i've been having like my own little crisis lately because i'm like what am i doing what do i contribute and i had a really nice conversation with my friend the other day who told me that maybe i'm just a renaissance woman and i get to like the fact that I get to like have this space and hold this space and uplift other people um, in whatever it is that they're doing is like, is, is enough. It's, it's like its own art. And so I'm trying to like remind myself that that's an important role <laughs> in all of this too. So yeah, it's just like, I got, I wouldn't do any of it if my art friends weren't all just dope artists. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think what you're both doing is motivational and inspiring to others to be involved and to, you know, test the waters of their craft or their artistry. So congrats and applause to both of you. I mean, you're inspiring me uh, thoroughly. I mean, besides the recording <laughs> and fashion week, what else is uh, coming up in the next few months for Relative Arts and the two of you? Well, we are heading to New Mexico um, to do a pop-up on in um, mid-August, which might be in the time machine right now. So it, that might have already <laughs> happened, but um, that's our next big step for the summer. Um, and then we'll be working on launching our uh, fall winter collection, which mm -hmm. will include holiday. Um, and we're hoping to get that done by September. So keep an eye out for us um, and the new fall winter collection in September. Um, we also are lucky to work with the American Indian community house here. That's been around in New York city since the seventies. Um, they have a great pop-up out on governor's Island um, that we're going to participate in in September. We have some really great pop-ups coming in Um to the shop in September as well. Kiani Botanics and Shy Natives are going to be doing a pop-up. Um, let's see. What Scoot is and Coffee on the deck? in October. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're very excited about and that. And then also Indigenous Peoples Day is in October as well. And we generally, uh, New Yorkers, a lot of New Yorkers come together to go out to Randall's Island to celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, and so we'll be having a presence out there. Um, yeah, we've got a lot on the calendar. Um, a lot of fun fun and exciting things coming up. Yeah, and I'm just like really excited to see what comes out of our time in New Mexico, which will already have passed by the time this is airing. But um, I love just like thinking about how 
it's an opportunity for all of us to come together and actually like have, spend some face time together mm-hmm. and like see each other and continue to grow these relationships and you know meet new people um so i can only imagine like what's what will be a brewing um you know after after swaya and and the shy summer market that's taking place so in such a short amount of time what has really surprised you at the overall response and what are you surprised that you haven't received the response that you thought, Oh, mm-hmm. this would be quick to action. Oh, we'd get, you know, we'd get on the cover of this or these people would be reaching out to us, but haven't, I guess the mm-hmm. trial and tribulation. There's so much I want to say, but I don't, I don't want to sh- throw shade at anybody. <laughs> 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 there's, there's w- w- one publication that I had expected to have an article in that we have not had one yet. So we'll stay tuned for that. All right. But otherwise, <laughs> I am so, I'm so impressed and surprised by word of mouth. I can't ex- explain enough that w- how fast it's gotten out just word of mouth and through our social media networks that everybody is excited and sharing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And everybody that comes in is like, Oh yeah, my friend shared this post on Instagram. So I found you guys and came in and it's just, it's kind of been like that every time. Um, And I would love to be, uh, you know, get to do the cover of magazines and things like that. So we'll see one day. (laughs) Hey, you know what? I am just amped that we have been featured twice now in Indian Country Today. And that was like our first like official publication Mm -hmm. was just like when we sent out our press release about our opening and and we were covered. We were we were a little blurb under Jason Momoa. So once we are (laughs) above Jason Momoa, there you go, there you go, then we'll we'll know that (laughs) we've made some progress. But Um, No, that's just been, it's been really awesome. I love like all the coverage that we're getting like from, from places like Indian Country Today and the Navajo Times and this podcast. And we did Broken Boxes podcast with our friend Ginger um, a couple of months ago. And that, um, that was just like really a joy. It's like, obviously we want like the big, the big hitters, the heavy hitters to like, you know, come and give us our flowers. But um, it's, just kind of this like natural organic like growth that we've had in um and the opportunities that we've been able to again just like work right, with right. our community like broken boxes podcast i'm like such a huge fan of ginger i love that podcast and the fact that she got to like come and sit in our living room and just like hang out with me for a few us for a few hours in my living room was was so fun um yeah i think that like the thing that I feel like I'm always as the operational person and the person who's always thinking about the, the, um, you know, how we're being held back and we haven't been able to see, like, we haven't been able to grow at the rate that we are ready to like break out and do it. So I will say that as far as it's like capitalism, man, it's so weird because you think you see all the time these like stories of like little Miss Muffin's Bakery, <laughs> just two gals from wherever and they like got on Shark Tank and have like a bajillion dollars to like start their thing and they're just like take off and they're in Target and like no, no one has come to us yet to like be like, this right. is really great. Let me just give you <laughs> this. So we are really like you know, surviving on like kind of a, a week by week, day by day. Um, and it's, uh, you know, we, we still have our day jobs. I still have to go teach at the museum. Karina's, you know, still uh, taking orders for her line. So um, that's that's kind of a thing is like in, in this like late stage capitalism, you think that when you have a great idea that everyone's going right, to be knocking right. on your door to support you, especially because we're like, you know, in this moment where everyone's like diversity and inclusion and equity and oh <laughs> like let's hear from indigenous voices and people of color and like uh oh, but yeah, yeah no no one's called us up yet i said we haven't taken any big oil money they haven't even called us for me to turn <laughs> down yet you know <laughs> so what has been some of the unforeseen hurdles and barriers and i guess doors that you've haven't broken down or knocked on yet mm. 
We're definitely navigating the world of funding. Yeah. Uh, definitely. So just small business grants, um, minority owned women's grant, bleh, minority owned women's business mm-hmm. grants, all the many grants and all the different little taglines you can put ahead of our names. <laughs> you know, we're trying to navigate yeah. those um, and just trying to see, uh, you know, how much we can get uh into this little investment because right now it has been personal investments been community funded um i i i hate saying it every time but it's the truth that the biggest hurdle is always going to be money it's just going to be mm-hmm. new york is expensive i say it costs 50 dollars to cross the street <laughs> so you know navigating through this space i mean if we need to get, catch an uber you know it's like outrageously right. expensive so We're still navigating that. That's been our biggest learning curve. Um, But Leanna has been really, really uh, pivotal at at making those phone calls and getting those answers, um, which I might have a little bit more anxiety around doing that she's got a lot more power behind her. So it's been really helpful. So interesting to navigate, though. I guess if like we were going to offer any like uh, unsolicited advice right now. It's one thing that I've learned that I had no idea about. I had never started started a, a small business before. We uh, decided to uh, officially come together as an LLC, um, and just even you know, and we made that decision consciously to like not be a nonprofit because the nonprofit industrial complex is like a whole other bag of snacks. Yeah, um, yeah. And so you know, we are an LLC, but then even as a uh, like a startup business, a, a new growing business, there are so many things that are not available to you. It's almost like they, they have to like put you through the ringer for a year before you can even access, have that like extra bit of access. So we don't get to right. uh, register as a minority or woman owned business uh, as far as the government is concerned until we're really? in operation for a year. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and a lot of small bo- like business loans that you want to apply for, you have to be in operation for like over a year and like be able to give them your taxes and show that no. you're like growing exponentially before they'll back, you know? So it's like all these things where everyone's like, just go and get it. You, you check all the boxes and like, just do it. It's like, no, but like, we have to like, it is like sink or swim in this first year. And we are just like treading water the best that we can. And I am not a great swimmer. I doggy paddle. <laughs> <laughs> but but we are, we're, we're trying. So yeah, it's just, it's like interesting to just like think about like how we will, um, how to like ethically source working capital, um, what it means for us to be an LSD. I just had a vision tell me. of a beaded life jacket. <laughs> 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 yes oh my gosh well maybe because of the weight you might sink i don't know <laughs> i know i'm like it may not be practical but it would look the, great yeah. Look right, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah so that's it's just that's been the main challenge is is it it and, and it's so important to us it is at the very like heart of of our ethos and everything that we do that our artists get paid Right. And um, so, you know, those are always the people we we pay out first uh, before maybe even like Con Ed or our insurance or like whatever. Um, And so it's it's finding this balance and like being able to like get this money in so that we can like take it to the next level so that our artists can get the most out of working with us and so that we can support them. But like, also, yes, at the end of the day, we have to support ourselves and it all of us goes into this and um, it's it's uh, it's taxing to have to do this and this job never turns off in my brain. But then like also I have to go teach five classes of sixth graders, uh, you know, like in the Bronx and then oh, geez. get back to my <laughs> shop in the East Village and come back to my home in Brooklyn. So um, there's not enough. There's not enough of us. <laughs> not enough time in the day. <laughs> yeah. Do you, has there been a lot of um, barriers still? I mean, I can answer this probably for you, but I'll let you answer uh, yourselves in your point of view. Is there still a lot of barriers for indigenous women owned businesses to get started? Is the stereotype still there? Yeah. 
Yeah, I would say. Yes. And I think that a thing that we've been experiencing, navigating probably just as our whole, and our, our whole entire lives as being Indigenous women uh, is the fact that people will be so quick to like question us or our intentions or call out our flaws. And we see Indigenous men navigating mm-hmm. these spaces and coming up without having to constantly defend themselves. Um, and that is something that's pretty just like frustrating to, to navigate. Yeah. It's unfortunate. Sometime this world has to change and recognize women are the stronger sex. <laughs> it's just, it's a fact. No. <laughs> they bear a lot. <laughs> and you. I think that my own point of view, I'm throwing it out there. Um, who are you surprised <laughs> by the accolades? It's like, Oh, we didn't, we didn't expect to hear from those people. Wow. The Guardian was huge. Yeah. <laughs> like that's yeah. uh, I think that that really hit they me. They came to opening yeah, day. Yeah, they came to opening day and I thought it was just going to be like a small little thing and like like just a little quick piece mm-hmm. or whatever, but like we ended up being the new faces of small business and it was like the relaunch of this uh entire like article series. So we were kind of like the first mm-hmm. one when they're like really relaunching it. They came to the shop to we got like multiple interviews. We got, they came to the shop to do like a special photo shoot with us. And that was really, that was like the biggest thing that I've ever had in like my career. Um, and I think it really hit me uh, when my friend who lives in Prague in the Czech Republic, I spent a few years living in the Czech Republic. So I've got weird friends everywhere. <laughs> um, and my friend Connor, who lives in Prague, hit me up on Instagram with a screenshot, which is like, well, look what I just saw while I was having my morning coffee. And like I had made it through his like news feed without him wow. seeing it from me, it just popped up, and I was like, "Dang, okay." <laughs> you're global. So, you're you're global, and you didn't shabby. even know it. Yeah. <laughs> right? So the pop up you mentioned you're gonna be have a few pop ups uh, touring around. What actually constitutes a pop up, and what's who's it participating in those pop ups? Yeah, we were really lucky to um, get the go ahead from the artists in our store to travel with their collections in order to do pop-ups here and there um, and just bring more attention to what we're doing in the shop. So we're traveling all the way to New Mexico um, with over 20 artists and a lot of insurance (laughs) (laughs) and, (laughs) and, um, and then we'll be doing some pop-ups in New York to just get the word out. Um, But we, we, just recently did a pop-up at a film fundraiser um, for our friend who was a Tisch graduate um, whose name's Shane. Um, and it was really, really successful. It was uh, all different kinds of people who were attending this film screening and supported the, the work that we were doing and were really excited to see us there. And a lot of those people hadn't had a chance to stop by the shop yet. So in any instance where we can kind of get out to where there's people, we're going to try and do our best to do that, to make sure that we're representing everybody, um, you know, as, as well as we can be and to be be bringing the shop to the faces of many people. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, ladies, any closing comments as we wrap up? You can follow us on Instagram (laughs) at Relative Arts. (laughs) It's at Relative Arts NYC. Um, And then any emails can go to info at Relative Arts NYC dot com. And our official website is Relative Arts NYC dot com. Yes. And uh, if you find yourself in New York City, Lenape Hoking, come and visit us in the East Village. We're on 10th between B and C. Our address is 367 East 10th Street. Um, And definitely follow us. Uh, I think the most, uh, the way to find our most like up to date, what we're doing is uh, on Instagram. And maybe if we can catch a little time once we get back from New Mexico, we're going to be working on um, launching our online store. Fantastic. Well, I'm excited to see what's ahead. For relative arts and from you too it's been 
a joy and you're phenomenal what you're doing. It's very inspirational. So thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you, Mado.